Catherine Knight came from a troubled background and, later in life, was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. The disorder is characterized by low impulse control, low empathy, unstable identity, and extremely volatile mood swings. She would fail to get help for her past trauma and, as such, went down a dark path. When her boyfriend tried to break up with her, she would leave a crime scene so chilling, several of the police officers who were first on the scene went vegan and quit their jobs. This is the story of the first woman to get life in prison with no chance of parole in Australian history. Her mother, Barbara Rowan, had four children with her husband when she decided to have an affair with her husband's dear friend. Catherine was a result of her mother's affair with Ken Knight, and the scandal shook the small conservative town they were a part of. Unfortunately, Ken would turn out to be an alcoholic and an abuser. The full extent of this trauma is hard to find accurate detailed sources for, and while her childhood provides context to her later actions, they in no way excuse the horrific deeds Catherine Knight would later commit. Catherine was a bully in school, preying on smaller victims, and dropping out at age 15, illiterate. She went to work at a clothing factory for about a year before she would land her dream job at the slaughterhouse. As an adult, she would have four major relationships, all of which follow a very similar pattern. The first man's name was Kellett. She convinced him to marry her by getting him drunk and keeping him that way the entire time. Her mother's warnings fell on deaf ears incapable of making a rational decision. And in 1974, they were married in no time. They consummated their marriage three times. When Kellett fell asleep, she wanted a fourth. He wasn't receptive, and so she began to strangle him. He awoke and fought her off, but for some reason remained married to her for ten more years. Unsurprisingly, Knight was abusive to her children as well. For example, because Kellett was unfaithful and at least once snuck out in the middle of the night, Catherine placed her two-month-old baby on a set of train tracks. The train didn't come, so the baby lived. She was institutionalized for this, and on two other occasions, for similar actions. She had also been diagnosed with postpartum depression for violently swinging her child's stroller down a busy street. She would be committed again for taking hostages in an attempt to force Kellett back after the divorce. The second time she was committed was after he had left her, and while in the insane asylum, she had threatened to kill a mechanic for fixing Kellett's car, allowing him to escape. Even still, she was released, and shortly after her breakup, she was back in another relationship. It was 1986, and she got together with David Sanders, a local miner. In a few months, he moved in with her and her two daughters. He kept his apartment and she quickly became suspicious whenever he wasn't in sight. She was so jealous of the unsubstantiated affairs he was supposedly having that at one point she slit the throat of his dingo puppy to show him what she was capable of. For some reason, they stayed together and had a daughter the year after. She tried to kill David with a pair of scissors shortly after. This was what caused him to finally have the good sense to leave her. She wasted no time getting into the next relationship, this time with John Chillingworth. They were together three years and had a child named Eric. There were no reported violent actions taken by her during this time, and the relationship ended after he learned that she was having an affair with John Price. She went straight into another relationship with John afterward. They met at a nightclub, and he was aware of her reputation going into the relationship but decided to continue anyway, baffling all reason and instincts for self-preservation. The beginning of their relationship was uneventful, and his two children seemed to like Catherine. They moved in together in 1995. She had decorated the house with taxidermy 
and hung her prized possessions, a set of butcher's knives, above the bed. Her actions turned ugly when he rejected her marriage proposal. She reported him for stealing discontinued medical kits from his work and ended his 17-year-old career as a miner. He kicked her out as a result, but foolishly got back together with her a few months later. His friends lost respect for him because of this move, and they stopped talking to him as a result. They continued arguing a lot during this time, and she was trying to get control of his house. She was vocal about wanting to kill Price. And in February of 2000, she and Price got into an argument that ended with her attempting to stab him in the chest. He took out a restraining order to try and keep his kids safe. He started telling co-workers that if he ever went missing, it was because Catherine killed him. On February 29, 2000, John Price came home from work, checked in with his neighbors, and went to bed about 11 p.m. Shortly after, Catherine arrived. She made herself dinner, watched TV, showered, and went upstairs to see him. She woke Price, slept with him, and he went back to bed. She then took down her knives and began stabbing him. Crime scene evidence indicates he woke up and attempted to flee. He was stabbed repeatedly and eventually made it out the door, only to be dragged back inside. All in all, he was stabbed 37 times. She then skinned him and hung his pelt in the doorway to their house. She decapitated him, throwing his head into a pot with vegetables to make a stew. She also cut his glutes into steaks. She then cooked them with potatoes, various vegetables, and even gravy. She made three plates, two of which had notes with his children's name on them, and a third was thrown into the yard untouched. She then consumed a large number of pills and passed out. The police were called after Price didn't show up for work the next day. With the things he had been saying and the fact he was always at work on time no matter what, his co-workers were worried about him. The police discovered the horrors inside and detained the comatose knight. Several of the police quit and many wouldn't touch meat for years. Paramedics suspected she had tried to kill herself, but forensic toxicologist Dr. William J. Allender discovered she had merely taken too much of an antidepressant and an antihistamine. She claimed to have no memory of the night before. The judge stated that she had never expressed any remorse for her actions and that if released, she would pose a serious threat to society. He was convinced she premeditated the killing and ruled that she wasn't legally insane and thus responsible for her behavior. The judge stated, The last minutes of his life must have been a time of abject terror for him, as they were a time of utter enjoyment for her. She initially pleaded not guilty, but changed her plea without a stated reason. The jury was dismissed, and she was charged with the murder of John Price in 2001 he decided the only appropriate penalty for the prisoner is life imprisonment and that parole should never be considered for her. She should never be released, and she is the only woman in Australia to receive such a sentence so far. She will live out the rest of her life in the Silverwater Women's Correctional Center in New South Wales. Life on the inside has treated her well, however. She works hard in a factory daily from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. where she makes headphones. She takes pride in her work and gets more done than anyone else. Afterward, she eats lunch and goes to her cell. She is something of a hoarder and has a large table in her room to make art. She's made it her new home. She is reportedly a skilled artist who never signs any of her work to stop people from making money off her name just because she killed someone. She has apparently allowed them to sell her art to raise money for charity. None of her family ever visited her, and she has no friends on the outside. On the inside, however, she is the boss of the cell block. She is known as Nana, and has apparently never committed violence in prison. Her reputation carries enough weight to make that unnecessary. She even resolves conflict with the other inmates. Even the guards are afraid of her, 
and she screams at them for searching through her room. She will always be considered a security risk and will never be allowed outside for any reason. It was plain to see that she was dangerous and unstable, yet all of these men stayed in a relationship long after it made sense not to do so. It is likely that all of them had their own rationale. Perhaps it was the sunk cost fallacy at work, or self-loathing, or perhaps her wild mood swings that created irresistible highs and lows, creating instability and serving to function as a psychological addiction. No matter what the case, it is clear that one should always be careful who they let into their lives and avoid interacting with clearly unhinged people, no matter how appealing they may be on the surface. <laughs>